Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. As the director of CUNY's internship program in government and public affairs, Dr. An Anthony Maniscalco teaches the importance of civic engagement and provides students the experience of working in the public interest. And in, in his new book, really his dissertation, Public Spaces, Marketplaces, and the Constitution, he calls for renewed protection of public space because he believes that citizen participation is what makes democracy work. And he's my guest today. So you come from it at all angles, right? You're a political theorist and you're a practical politician. You're even called the resident professor of the state assembly. You're teaching young people what it means to do public service. And at the same time, you are concerned about what happens in a democracy and the roles people play. You've got a very nice balance there. Thank you. Let's start with the internship program. Mm -hmm. The uh, CUNY internship program, which was you know, renamed after Professor Ed Rogowski, who was my mentor when I was a student at Brooklyn College in the CUNY system, uh, looks to bridge the classroom to the practical world of government and public affairs throughout the city, state, and even in Washington, D.C. So we provide students uh, with an opportunity to uh, serve and learn in offices of elected officials, non-governmental organizations, advocacy groups, on-campus groups, federal agencies, city agencies, state agencies. At the same time, we uh, ask them to uh, participate in an academic course alongside the internship so that they have an opportunity to study government and public affairs at the same time that they're participating um, in it by interning in these environments so that they not only get uh, experience and, and training um, in these areas, but that they also kind of develop a critical distance so that they can think about the big picture while they're inhabiting and I'm learning I'm glad they could get that critical distance because <laughs> I would like them not to all be swayed by what they see sometimes, right? You and me both. <laughs> so then it's a real class. I mean, it's a semester's course. And it's combined with the classroom and the practical politics. They live up in Albany if in, they're in the state? In the case of the uh, State Assembly and State Senate internship, mm -hmm. they actually go and live in Albany for a full five months through the legislative session. They serve full time in the offices of assembly members and senators, and then they participate in a 15 credit academic component, which kind of pulls them out of their uh, legislators' offices and into the classroom so that they can you know, think theoretically and reality check the in-government mm -hmm. experiences that they're having. Mm -hmm. And they get a stipend to live on? They do, they do. Such uh, a great opportunity. How many students do you place a year? We, uh, the, the programs themselves place students and we, uh, you know, rally applications from CUNY. So the assembly has 150 interns, one per mm -hmm. member, mm -hmm. and the Senate has some 30 interns. And CUNY has... Uh, about 25% of those uh, in this session, which is pretty remarkable it's when pretty you think great. about a program yeah. that's statewide and, in fact, hosts yeah. students from all over the country and the world. And then you have a program in the city also. We do. We with do. the city council. We have a program with the city council. The we mayor's play, office. We, have, we place students the with the mayor's office, the public advocate, the controller, any number of NGOs throughout the city. Um, and of course, we place students in the elected, you know, in state legislators' mm -hmm. offices in their communities, mm -hmm. so that they're kind of working on constituent relations. And then and, they have a, like a one day a week seminar course. It, it can be a one day or a two day a week seminar. And again, the idea is to have them really be thinking about both of these kinds of environments at once, so that when they come out of this experience, they're well trained in not only what they're being asked to do on a daily basis, but they're also thinking about what's the meaning of this, you know. What's the appropriate role for me to play in this mix of government and public affairs? And then you come at it from another point of view because you produce a television show every month called the CUNY Forum. It is, yeah. And do the students go to that? They do. It's actually part of the academic component <laughs> of their uh, New York City internship. So, you know, it ain't the wire, but right. it's, a, it's a lot of fun putting it together. It's a moderator and four panelists who discuss and debate current issues uh, controversial issues, issues of import to New Yorkers and uh, people around the state. It's, and then in the summer, there's a Washington program. There is. It's a you know, full-time residential program. They live, learn, 
and love Washington politics for the time that they're there, in spite of what may be happening in Washington. Yeah. Is that separate from the pages? I guess that is. It's a totally different program. Yeah, yeah. this is, uh, for the most part, they're serving on Capitol Hill mm -hmm. in the legislative offices of members of the New York City delegation, the two senators, uh, a few NGOs, a few federal agencies, and just like the program in Albany and the program in New York City, they participate in an academic component. We send them each week to the headquarters of um, different, you know, uh, non-governmental organizations where people pro bono give them about 90 minutes to two hours of their time um, and show them, you know, sort of, how, sort of how they got to be where they are and what, what they do, uh, how it impacts, uh, you know, government. government. So are they, is their life really affected by this? Does it, does it travel with them for a long time? I think so. Uh, we're really in the business of providing stackable credentials for the interns who come through our programs, whether it's city, state, or nation. I have uh, a somewhat contradictory take on this. I think for a lot of our students, they're going to get turned on to this, and they're going to want to participate in the public sphere in a much more active way than they had previously, whether it's by running for office or working for an elected official you know, creating their own non-governmental organization or non-profit. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, a lot of our students come out of these experiences going, I don't want to have anything to do with this ever again. And I'm Isn't perfectly comfortable with that choice because yeah. I just want them to be educated consumers of their own career paths. Right. Does that mean then the ones who don't want to have anything to do with it, that we've lost their interest in being in citizenship? I hope not. Um, I think there is always a percentage of students who really kind of walk away from this and turn in or turn, you know, turn towards something else, perhaps something in the private sector. I do think all the students with whom we've worked, or I should say, you know, a significant share of the students with whom we work, kind of, you know, they imbibe this and, and it really mm -hmm. becomes embedded in the way they think about what they're doing, whether it's in the private or public sector. So I wouldn't say we lose them as citizens. Mm -hmm. I would just say some of them think, this is not the are. right walk of life for me, professionally speaking. Mm -hmm. Did they come with a background in civics? Sadly, <laughs> very few students come to us with a background in civics, right? I mean, you know, we don't have that in high schools anymore. I mean, no. I think you and I both got that yeah. when we were in school. Um, are these students, generally speaking, more publicly, publicly interested than their counterparts who don't come through our internship program? Probably. It may be biographical, it might be something else. They tend to be interested in the kinds of things that I think you and I are, but they really need their first and second and third forays in order to get knowledge. It's such an incredible loss. You know, the, all these testing, I mean, now it's to get the test scores, but then they, these national assessment tests, the one last year, mm -hmm. it, it, it showed a very little increase in the knowledge of civics from the year before and the year before. And those figures are something like two-thirds of the students did not know there were three branches of government. Mm -hmm. And as somebody cited in a speech, but they could name many of the, the three stooges, <laughs> the names of each of the three mm -hmm. stooges. So, I mean, that is, we're lacking that. We worry about uh, the shrinking number of voters in elections, and still we don't teach what it means to be part of a democracy. I, I agree. Um... You know, per the book, I mean, they're... Well, I was going to say, I, now you come at, from another angle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this book, which was your dissertation, and it worries about the connection, I guess, between the availability f of, market pl of places where free speech can be exercised. Right. It's right. shrinking. Why? It is. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of, a lot of causes for that. Uh, the focus of the book is on the legal system and, and how um, court decisions primarily at the federal level, but also at the state level, have, have really served to diminish the amount of ground space available for the conduct of politics in this country. So, you know, we all support free speech. I don't think you're going to get anybody among the 310 million of us to say, I don't support free speech. The question becomes, where can you exercise your right to free speech? And the problem that the book looks at is that that where is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. There are other causes. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to pretend that this is you know, all at the uh, doorstep of the Supreme Court. A lot of public space is being bought up. It's being privatized. And uh, it's being taken offline 
for purposes of First Amendment expression. However, I grew up, you know, with the decisions of the Warren Court um, and, you know, always looked at the Supreme Court as the sort of the hero that would save us in terms of civil rights and civil liberties. It turns out that, you know, from the 70s on, the court, in my opinion, has been a real culprit in uh, helping to diminish the amount of usable space available in places like shopping malls, in places that we uh, think of as quintessentially public parks, sidewalks, um, streets. And so I think we're really in a rut here. Um, if you don't feel comfortable inhabiting a space for free speech purposes, then you might not do it at all. And we get what I believe is a uh, diminished public sphere where people feel comfortable about speaking uh, on controversial issues. When I was young, uh, around Columbus Circle, mm -hmm. there would be all of these uh, uh, crates, milk boxes, and you could any you had you went from one box to another all around the circle, uh, with a trolley car going around. Also, <laughs> I mean, I can't believe that's how old I am. Uh, but talking about anything, I mean, all different topics. But you had to have an American flag. Mm -hmm. I think you still can do that on the city streets if you have a, a soapbox and an American flag. I think you can talk, right? Yeah, the, the Speaker's Corner model yeah. you know, from Hyde Park in London mm -hmm. is, is still active. Um, the challenge there is that often that speech is regulated under time, place, and manner restrictions. So we don't say you can't do it, but we say where, quite, you, can. where you can and for what time, and you, you, know, you can't use loudspeakers. You, know, you, you, know, you, you can have to get a can. permit, always. And, and the permitting process can be whether anybody wants to admit it or not, somewhat prejudicial. The streets really don't belong to the people anymore. I, I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I still want to think that they do. There is evidence that they belong uh, to the businesses that inhabit them as much as, if not more than, the people who walk. That reminds me when I worked for in the city hall, the young lords were ascending in East Harlem, <laughs> and uh, they would be on the streets, and the police would go and take them, and you'd have to get a permit to demonstrate. And I remember it talking to. Felipe Luciano saying, you got to get a permit. He said, but Ronnie, the streets belong to the people. <laughs> it was, you know, kind of, uh, that was, that's the concept, and it doesn't happen. So you talk a lot about the suburban development and how that's affected the ability. Suburbs, you know, as a, uh, a dedicated city dweller and a feminist, I always, we always worried about the women who moved to the suburbs with their babies, that there was no way of meeting anybody, mm -hmm. and that it was an isolated community, because that was before the internet and all of that. But it is still an isolated community, right? Unless you have a place to meet. Right, I'm, and, and in many ways, the, the book is really looking at uh, suburbs, where you know a significant share of Americans live, let's face it. I mean, I'm a city boy too. Yeah. Um, so I don't have a lot of experience residentially where suburbs are concerned, but let's, let's admit that a lot of people live in suburbs. There are no streets and sidewalks, right? There, you know, there, the parts are pretty much, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and, and this is why I, I, you know, really want to point to the importance of shopping malls, even though they're declining in their, in their older form. Those are the places where people actually get out of their cars for a minute they okay. were the downtowns. And exactly. Yeah. And they're, they're the downtown business districts, the shopping districts of yesteryear. So I think they are vital um, in suburban communities, which, by the way, are really changing demographically. I mean, that, that script is being flipped, right? The idea of, mm -hmm. you know, suburbs being, uh, you know, gray flannel right. and, and cities and being melting. Class, middle, yeah. That's not the case anymore. I mean, you know, you can't get Section 8 vouchers in New York City anymore, so where are they being honored in suburbs and other places around the yeah. state? Where are people going to go if they want to express their ideas, even if they're controversial? So what happens? Tell me the history of the legislation. So, uh, you know, I kind of think about it in terms of a storyboard. Um, in the late 40s, um, you know, after FDR packed the court with, uh, with you know, people who were going to be more friendly towards civil rights legislation, property regulation, and, and free expression, the court took a case in a company town, mm. uh, a case called Marsh Against Alabama, where a Jehovah's Witness, Grace Marsh, 
tried to proselytize on the downtown business uh, street of this company town, right? So it's a privately owned company town, and she wants to spread her message. Of course, the sheriff, on behalf of the company that owned the town, said, get out of here. She refused, and she was ultimately arrested for trespass. The Supreme Court upheld Marsh and said that her uh, right to free speech trumped the uh, business interests of the company town owners and the businesses on the block. It was something called the preferred position, uh, the doctrine of preferred position, uh, that our need for free speech, at times anyway, trumps the property rights of owners. That was kind of the doctrine for about 20 years, and then, of course, between you know 1946 and the late 60s, suburbs explode, mm -hmm. and so we have an entirely new geography that we've got to consider, you know, legally, mm -hmm. culturally, and politically. In 1968, a case came before the court involving a supermarket at a major shopping mall development in Pennsylvania. Again, the contest was between the, the private labor. property rights and a labor union, exactly. Thurgood Marshall, who turns out to be a big hero in this book, stood for the rights of the labor union and their free speech and said, look. They wanted to pick it. They wanted to pick it. And of course, the owner said, you got to get out of here. Um, Marshall says, no, you don't have to get out of here. The suburbs are the places where people are congregating now. We have to deal with cultural and social change as it's actually taking place these people need to be able to use shopping malls for free speech, just, the, just in the same way that they did streets mm -hmm. in older cities. Otherwise, we're not going to have free expression in this country. The challenge there was that Marshall said the speech has to be related to the activity in the shopping mall. So a labor union picketing a mm -hmm. supermarket was directly related to what was happening in that area, in that space. Four years later, Nixon gets to appoint a whole bunch of uh, members, and the Burger Court becomes. And the Burger Court was very much about reversing some of the doctrines of the Warren Court, right? We know that, historically speaking. I mean, Burger would say this pretty plainly. It's a shopping mall in Portland, Oregon now, and Vietnam, anti Vietnam protesters want to start passing out leaflets in a mall there. Ultimately, the court changes its tune and says, no go. We think shopping malls are really just places for business. They're places where people buy and sell things. Moreover, the speech here had no relationship to the cause of the mall, right? Vietnam and a shopping mall, what do those things have to do with one another? And so you now had this exception that was playing out legally. The speech has to be related to the mall. So now, right, we're Married starting, right, the tr the, we're, we're trending downward, yeah. right? Four years later, feeling its oats, the Supreme Court, in a case in Georgia, throws the First Amendment out of shopping malls entirely and says, look, speech has nothing to do with the buying and the selling that takes place in a commercial center such as this one. Only state actors are prohibited from impinging on the rights of people to use their uh, speech. So the state action doctrine, which was you know, from the late 19th century, gets invented, at least where shopping malls are concerned. And that's pretty much the end of it. The First Amendment is Gone. excluded, right? Four years later, this is all, it's like, you know, this is all happening when the Olympics are. Um, the court kind of does a little bit of a nuance and says, in a case involving California, the federal First Amendment does not protect speech in shopping malls. However, if California or other individual states want to protect free speech under their expression clauses, they are at liberty to do so. And so now, from 1980 on, you get a situation where even though the Supreme Court has said no-go, the individual states are free to allow people to use shopping malls for free speech. Sounds wonderful, right? The problem is that very few states, states have taken the invitation. California's done it, New Jersey's done it, and three other states have two of those with, when it comes to uh, electioneering. You can do it, but you can't do it at any other time of the year. Yeah. So that means that fully 45 states 
have declined to take the Supreme Court's invitation, which means that in 45 states, you can't use a shopping mall to, and I, I'm not talking about Occupy Wall Street, right. I'm talking about and, uh, you know, leafleting, yeah, yeah right? Yeah. So this is, this is the current legal terrain on which we sit. I find that problematic because I think suburbs are places where the mix of identities that we associate with cities are happening because, you know, poorer and, and more uh, racially and ethically diverse uh, Americans live in suburbs now. Where are they going to negotiate? Yeah. Where are they going to contest ideas? So I think what the book is saying, at least where mm -hmm. suburbs are concerned, is we have to really look at this legal doctrine and we, we really need to consider. And California is always ahead of us, isn't it? It's incredible. I know. Let's talk about New York because we have sure. two examples, I think, at least. But in New York, <clears throat> builders get bonuses, build bigger and larger if they provide public space. But it's a privately owned public space. Mm -hmm. It's not a public space. So that's one restriction where we're selling, we're giving what are we doing? I mean, we're giving away, I don't know, we're privatizing public lands. I, you know, it, that's the problem. Uh, certainly, uh, Occupy Wall Street was really interesting, wasn't mm -hmm. it? About the occupation of a square that was really not a publicly owned, but it was a privately owned public space. Mm -hmm. and, the, and I think also they got into trouble with Trinity Church trying to occupy another blank thing. And now we've got uh, Times Square. Mm -hmm which you and I have a difference with to begin with. I don't like that public space. <laughs> I can't believe that New York City, that Broadway, which is known all over the world, you can't go down Broadway. <laughs> you have to, you know, detour for 42nd Street, detour for 34th Street. That's a little much. We are a city. But anyway, it's a public space. <laughs> and now we are restricting the use in that public space. Mm -hmm. So what do you say? Well, you know, <laughs> Stepping back to the, the bonus plaza uh, mm -hmm. dilemma, um, I am not convinced that the bonus plaza program, and of course it's been remediated a million times since yeah. 1961, is granting enough ground space for anything. I mean, it doesn't have to be about expressing political ideas. It could just be about hanging out, yeah, right? right. Um, it's locked. It, it's, it's locked. It's hard to find it. It's foreboding. It, it, you know, yeah. it, I, I'm not. I'm and now not, it's more commercial than ever. I mean, well, now it's restaurants. Right? That, that's one of the interesting things. I mean, I think these, these some of these bonus plazas are now glamorized food courts, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, which makes me question the publicness of that public provision. But we are relying on real estate developers to give us our public space right now. So we're already in trouble, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Occupy, however. The genius of Occupy was that they took over a privately owned public space in light of the fact that they would not have been able to conduct their movement in a publicly owned public space. Because Central Park closes, right. they would not have been able to do Stay encampments, yeah. right? Zuccotti did not have the same rule. By law, they were allowed to do encampments. And I think the genius of the folks who started the movement was that mm -hmm. they said, hey, you know what? we can take advantage of the bonus plaza rule and really set something up that will last for, you know, a significant mm -hmm. period of time. You know, what can you say about it toward the end? I don't know. I think there's a lot of different opinions about it. But, um, you know, I, I thought it was a, a really a stroke of genius on their part. Times Square. Um, you know, when I'm trying to get my zip card back to the thing, the loss of that slot through okay. Broadway bothers me, too. I'm with you. Um, <laughs> The thing I've been, you know, sort of focusing on where Times Square is concerned is the zoning right, of, right. of the pedestrian plaza. And, you know, uh, you know, I've never been accosted by an Elmo or, or a Spider-Man. Um, I think it's okay. I think I understand why people find it annoying uh, to, to be, you know, disturbed by some of the behaviors that take place there. My take on public space, and I think we see this in the history stuff that I do in the book, is that it is by definition sloppy. Real public spaces, the agora of, you know, Athenian, mm -hmm. of, of ancient Athens was messy. There's all kinds of wacky stuff happening in this open space. And part of my view on this is that you've got to tolerate it because that um, ability to enact public space within a central area is what makes the public sphere active. It's what makes 
us mm -hmm. animated. You know, I, the I energy I, and everything. Else. Exactly, exactly. So you know, you and I have a different take. I get it. I think they're tr look. I, the 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 Bratton plan. Let's just pull the whole thing up by the roots. Um, was absolutely unacceptable. So it's good to see <laughs> you know some of the council members yeah. uh, trying to regulate it and not get rid of it entirely. I, I wonder if it's going to work, and I wonder if that plaza is going to be as exciting and as big a draw once we start zoning Now, Union it, Square, though, suburbs. works pretty well, doesn't it? Union Square. It does, and it's, it's a much more, you know, open, unregulated right. space. But for the fact that, you know, there's about to be a big restaurant in, yeah. in the area where all the great protests yeah. of the early, you know, 20th century took place. So that's going to be offline. I mean, that yeah. just won't be there for us to say, you know, we want to we wanna protest this or say this about that. You know, we yeah. come to the end of this, so you have to come back because I don't, I wanted to ask you how you got interested in all of this, you know, how you grew up, and also what you think society, how it should go. In the meantime, though, this book, and I can call you Tony. Please. Professor Anthony is a little formal. <laughs> uh, will soon be out in uh, paperback. Yes. And it's, uh, what will it cost? It'll be twenty eight ninety five. Because right now it's $80. <laughs> It but hurt. it's sold out anyway it's on Amazon. Yeah, so. And you'll be able to get it at bookstores, everything. And it's a fascinating book, and people should read it. But you have to promise you'll come back so we can discuss more about political theory. I would be honored to do so. Thank you very much, Thank Professor you. Maniscalco. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> That's it. If there are any people you'd like to hear or topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.